This is Dr. Mubin Sayed from FLCCC platform. I am here with one more episode of Long Story Short with Dr. Bean. The discussion today is really interesting. We're going to talk about the mitochondrial damage by the spike protein and the mechanism of that. This particular study that I would discuss was published in February 22, this year's February. And this specific study was observing the mitochondrial damage in microglia of the brain. So it is kind of related to the neurological outcomes in acute COVID patients, or I would suggest even in the vaccine injury patients, although the authors did not suggest that. Plus, this is also very important for long COVID patients who have neurological outcomes. I will extrapolate this, that this same mechanism will occur in other cells as well where mitochondrial damage would occur because of spike protein. I would do some more discussions about the mitochondrial damage in the other cells by the spike protein. And I wanted to share something about a year and a half ago. I had invited Dr. Paul Merrick to have a discussion about math plus protocol. And by the way, you should go to the FLCCC. I'll, I'll share the links in a few minutes. So I had requested his time to discuss Math Plus protocol, and one part of that protocol is melatonin. Melatonin helps mitochondria escape the damage that occurs because of many inflammatory insults, including SARS-CoV-2 and spike protein. So I still remember clearly that he, he smiled and he said, I just asked people to do the math. And the math is the, the name of the protocol as well, Math Plus. So we are talking about something that FLCCC had actually expected and suggested possible solutions in terms of melatonin. Let's look at the exactly the damage that occurs to mitochondria. Why does that damage occur? And I would like you to hold a question in your mind, and that is, is it really that everything in the cell is being damaged, including mitochondria, and we are, or the authors or researchers are just picking up the mitochondria and saying, well, the mitochondria is damaged. Is it that? Or can they conclusively prove that it is only the mitochondria that gets damaged first, and then the remaining damage to the cell cascade would occur as well? So that is a question I would like you to hold in your mind. And as we discuss this, this answer should become clear. In addition to this, some takeaways that you should have is, number one, what is the value of this discussion? So you would see that the authors say that number one, they're providing the mechanism of how the spike protein causes damage. Secondly, they're providing information for how to detect. So there is a diagnostic information here because they used Raman spectrometry to do this analysis. So there's a diagnostic value in this. And the third one, they did not name any substances or medicines or therapies for mitochondrial health, but they did suggest that healthcare authorities, leaderships, doctors, they should look towards mitochondrial protection and therapies targeted to mitochondria as a result of looking at the data from their study. So with this, let's start our discussion. So some references first. So this is the FLCCC. And if you go here to protocols, you can actually see these protocols. I was talking about this Math Plus, but you can see here there is I prevent, I care, and I recover vaccine, I recover long COVID, and so on. So please give it a look. And melatonin discussions are here as well. This is the study that I'm going to be discussing today. This is another study by the same group that they have done last year in October. Then this is another study which shows that not only just the spike protein, but it is actually possible that, so here the, this is the spike protein, spike protein's effect on endothelium via ACE2. Today's talk you would see that the effect of spike protein that we would see today, the damage, is not through ACE2. It is an ACE2 independent damage. So that is a very interesting thing. Here is another study that is linked and that is endothelial damage via ACE2 binding of the spike protein. Then there is another study I have linked here. It is slightly different. This study actually shows that SARS-CoV-2 virus may have some other proteins too that may cause apoptosis and damage. And so then there are some more studies. 
This is Raman spectrometry. Myself for FLCCC, I believe, have no relationship to this company. I just used it to you have a link to read about what is this diagnostic tool. So with all of this, let's start. So once again, same study published in February 2022. Here is the summary of the study. If you look here on the right side first, what they said was that they did Raman spectrometry on the cells which were incubated with spike protein or with heat inactivated SARS-CoV-2. And they found in these cells that their mitochondria were severely damaged. And the damage that they saw was mitochondrial DNA amount had become almost half of a normal healthy cell's mitochondria. So that means or normal healthy cells mitochondrial DNA. That means the mitochondria were not able to make their own DNA and they were reducing in number as well. And this happened with spike protein alone or with SARS-CoV-2 which was heat inactivated. So my takeaway was that it is just a spike protein that is common in both of them. The other thing that they observed was if this was a damage to everything in the cell just because spike protein is there or the infection is there, then other parts of the cell would also have similar damage as mitochondria. And they observed lipid vesicles or lipid domes, which are or the content of lipid, which were present in other parts of the cell, for example, Golgi operators or smooth endoplasmic reticulum. I would discuss them a little later. You can just at this time think about it that cells have other components too which have lipid in them and if lipids were going to be damaged which did get damaged but only in the mitochondria these were not damaged in the other vesicles this was an evidence to say that spike protein's presence or SARS-CoV-2's presence specifically starts the damage by damaging the mitochondria similarly Golgi operators also has lipids and other components, other proteins in it. And Golgi apparatus remained healthy while the mitochondria were getting damaged. This all was a proof that it is the mitochondria that became the target, not the whole cell. Of course, when mitochondria fell, then the remaining cell fell as well. So that is the abstract, that is the summary. Now, what is the clinical outcome of it? And I'll go into the details of the mechanism a little later. I want to give you a complete summary of all aspects of this study. Clinical correlation was that this kind of mitochondrial damage, and remember they observed it in microglial cells. Microglial cells are the macrophages of the brain. They are the innate arm cells of the brain. And so what would happen is when the innate arm cells are damaged, then the nearby tissue would start inflammation. And that would cause the neurons to become inflamed, neurons to become damaged. And overall, neurocognitive decline will occur. I would suggest that you can pick up the mechanism, the same mechanism, and put it anywhere in the body. And if it happens there, then whatever is that tissue, that tissue would develop its own dysfunction. For example, if it is a heart tissue, again, this is not part of the study, this is me extrapolating. Imagine if it is heart tissue and the same thing happened there, then the cardiac function will be abnormal. If it is a blood vessel and this happened to the blood vessel cells, then the same dysfunction of the blood vessel would occur. So here, microglia and neurocognitive decline became a part and possibility after the damage to mitochondria. Now, I heard some of the questions about this study. One of the questions that was very common was that spike protein does not cross the blood-brain barrier or the SARS-CoV-2 does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So this is not a valid conjecture that this would happen to the people. And I agree with that. However, we have to realize that both in case of the infection and vaccination, there are people who develop neurological symptoms. There are people who develop severe neurological outcomes, even die. That means, yes, in general, this does not happen that spike protein or SARS-CoV-2 will cross the blood-brain barrier, but in some people it does, and they end up with severe symptoms. So now with that, here is the study. What they did was, they took a number of microglia, healthy microglia, and cultured them, cultivated them, incubated them by themselves as a control. They took another set, I made here in the diagram combined, but they had separate sets. 
they had another set where microglia were cultured with spike proteins only and in another set the microglia were cultured with heat inactivated sars-cov-2 which they called high sars heat inactivated sars-cov-2 so they have three sets control healthy cells then healthy cells co-incubated with spike protein and healthy cells co-incubated with sars-cov-2 which was inactivated now before we look at the damage let's just very quickly look at what are we talking about within the cell so start from the left side here here is a cell a cell inside the membrane of the cell this outer wall membrane inside the membrane everything is called cytoplasm which is inside the membrane and outside of the nucleus somewhere in the center of the most of the cells is a spherical structure which is the nucleus nucleus has a dna so outside of the nucleus and inside of the cell everything is called cytoplasmic space within the cytoplasmic space there are multiple organelle there are multiple things that work for the cell or that are part of the cell these are communities of working machines that are doing various things and this is important to note what things are there because these researchers looked at them and they reported about them so let's start from the center nucleus nucleus has dna correct and the enzymes and the histones and structures that are useful to manage the dna dna has genetic material that has recipe of our life in it it has various expressions to make various kind of proteins when our cell wants to make a protein for example let's say insulin from the dna the gene will open up that has the recipe to make insulin and a messenger rna will be constructed that will then escape or will exit the dna and come out in the cytoplasmic space right outside the dna and it is logical right outside the dna are the factories that will use those recipes to make proteins and it is logical for them to be outside because as the recipe comes out of the dna you want to quickly capture it and work on it so this little yellowish area outside the dna is endoplasmic reticulum endoplasmic reticulum in turn is smooth and rough rough endoplasmic reticulum is that part of the reticulum that has ribosomes attached to it ribosomes in turn are tiny machines that will pick up the rna and they would act on that rna and make proteins these machines are connected with the endoplasmic reticulum which is sort of a containing structure around the nucleus containers in the study they actually observed the endoplasmic reticulum as well now one more logical step here because there are factories ribosomes that are working to make proteins and the instructions are coming from inside the nucleus to say all right make this protein and now make this protein and now make that protein and the ribosomes are saying all right fine we're working on it it is logical that near the ribosomes and near the endoplasmic reticulum and near the nucleus will be a lot of energy delivering systems and those energy units or transformers or energy generators are mitochondria in my diagram here these blue things that are surrounding this whole complex are the mitochondria mitochondria somewhere in the past when we were probably a single celled animals or cells <laughs> mitochondria became part of our cells they were bacteria at that time and then now they're part of our cells and mitochondria are responsible to produce atp or energy for us our cell cannot use proteins or lipids or other fats directly so when we eat these nutrients our cell breaks them down into their smaller components then those smaller components are given to the machinery within the cell that includes mitochondria and that machinery would break down those tiny little nutritional units and use oxygen and glucose and amino acids sometimes and fats sometimes but mostly glucose and oxygen and water and they will make atp atp is the currency of the cell cell doesn't work with protein or other things it just works with atp so now every part of the cell has atp in it as energy and whenever anything works it says all right i need cash and the cash is atp then there is this little red thing that i've made which is called golgi apparatus 
Golgi operators had its own function. For example, many times when the proteins are formed in the endoplasmic reticulum, these are sent to Golgi operators for packaging. So folding, packaging, modifications, loading on other proteins is done in the Golgi operators. Even if a protein needs to be released from a cell, that packaging to release is also done in Golgi operators. Why am I talking about that too? Because they measured the damage or not the damage to Golgi operators too. So they measured mitochondria, they measured the harm or damage in endoplasmic reticulum, and they measured it in Golgi operators. And of course, I can tell you now that they saw only mitochondria getting damaged while the other structures were intact, which meant direct targeting of mitochondria by spikes or spike-related issues. Now, here is the mitochondria. Very quickly, because mitochondria used to be an independent thing on its own at some point, it has its own living structure. Inside, it is made up of two membranes. Inside of the mitochondria, there is its own DNA. Then, of course, from that DNA, it will make its own RNA that is still within the mitochondria. From that RNA, there are ribosomes that are within the mitochondria that will make proteins. And then those enzymes and proteins will work to help us make ATP. Inner walls of the mitochondria. There is a set of proteins and enzymes sitting there which are called electron transport chain. This electron transport chain uses the material, for example, pyruvate, that is produced in the cell after glycolysis. Glycolysis is a process where you take glucose and you break it down and try to produce energy. But then the pyruvate that is produced at the end of glycolysis is given over to mitochondria, which will further process that and make ATP using electron transport chain. So something to keep in mind for the next part of the discussion Cell can be operating in multiple phases of trying to produce energy. The best way for the cell is to do Krebs cycle or to use Cori cycle. And what happens is glucose enters the cell. It goes through the process of glycolysis in the cytoplasm of the cell. Then the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria. It is shuttled back and forth. There are lots of complex steps. But at the end of the day, that pyruvate is used to produce ATP. If mitochondrial function is disrupted, then of course the cell can only use glycolysis now. And glycolysis is an anaerobic respiration system. It is not very efficient, plus it produces lots of acid, plus it produces less amount of energy for the same amount of nutrients. And the result of that is our cells are not used to doing anaerobic function for a long time. So they will get damaged, the acids will be produced, which would further damage the cell first, and then the surrounding cells and the whole tissue would start breaking down and inflammation would occur. So keep these things in mind. And now let's see what they did. After they incubated the spike protein and the heat inactivated SARS-CoV-2 and separately the healthy microglia, then they observed them, the results, with a Raman spectrometer. What that meter is, it's a light meter. So what they do is they shine. So let's say here is a tiny amount of substance. So they actually shine light to even smaller substance than what you're seeing here. They shine a laser on it. And when the laser hits these components, or let's say if I go back here, this cell, it would hit various component and would become separated in various light waves. In every component, mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi operators, other parts of the cell, because of their composition, they all have a different energy level and different vibration that is occurring in them. Because of that, they all would separate out into a different kind of a Raman light. That light is then measured. So for example, let's say you have labeled the mitochondrial DNA with some specific enzyme which is going to emit a specific kind of light vibration and you now shine laser on it and there is the resulting Raman light and you are measuring it. And now if the cell is damaged and the mitochondria is damaged, then there will be less light getting back to the Raman spectrometer which is for the mitochondrial DNA. You might still get the other light coming in, for example, let's say the endoplasmic reticulum is fine, then that light and the amount of light will be fine. Let's say Golgi apparatus is fine, 
then the light coming from the Golgi apparatus will be a specific frequency and that will be fine as well. So this is how spectrometer can actually detect a subunit subunit, a mitochondrial's DNA, which doing this with regular microscopes is impossible. You cannot pose this question. For example, if I'm sitting here with my little microscope and you come to me and you say, hey, what I want to, you to do is to look at a cell, zoom into the mitochondria, then zoom further into the DNA of the mitochondria, and then tell me if the DNA's amount is correct or not. That's not going to happen <laughs> with the normal microscope. This is the beauty of the Raman spectrometer. This is the same kind of technology that is used, for example, in the James Webb scope, which is looking at the universe. So back here, after doing the spectrometry, they found the following. Number one, mitochondrial DNA in healthy cell was, for example, 2.2 milligram per milliliter for their measurement. The cells that were treated with spike, the mitochondrial DNA had declined to 1.2 milligram per milliliter, almost half. And similarly, same kind of amount of decline for heat inactivated SARS-CoV-2. Mitochondrial DNA amount became half. So either the number of mitochondria may have been the same, but the amount of DNA in them will, was less, or mitochondria were just not there in enough number. Then mitochondrial messenger RNA, that is inside the mitochondria. That went from 2.25 milligram per milliliter healthy cells to about 4 milligram per milliliter for spike and 2.8 for SARS-CoV-2. It was actually more for spikes. And what does this mean? They had actually linked other studies which showed that when there is a SARS-CoV-2 infection, then the mitochondrial RNA upregulates. And the reason for that is that when infection occurs, then there is an anabolic pressure on the cell. Anabolic pressure means that the cell is given a demand to make more things fast because we are making more viruses. So that anabolic demand translates into requiring more energy. Requiring more energy will mean mitochondria has to work more. So their RNA upregulates. So RNA upregulation in the mitochondria is a sign of extra pressure, extra demand on mitochondria. So here, within this, these two, you can actually now understand that when the spike protein or SARS-CoV-2 will arrive, they will put pressure on the cell to make more things and they would disrupt the cellular mechanisms, which will then demand more energy because of anabolic activities, which will put mitochondria under stress, it will upregulate its activities. In that process, it would start breaking down as well. So RNA upregulated means more activity. DNA downregulated means mitochondria are getting damaged. Okay, then what else did they see? This is very interesting. They saw that the saccharides reduce. If you see here, 1.5 milligram per milliliter of glucose and pyruvate versus 0.7 milligram per milliliter or 0.9 milligram per milliliter spike versus heat inactivated SARS-CoV-2 of pyruvate. What does that mean? That means glycolysis is increasing, but pyruvate production and the utilization within the mitochondria is not happening. This also means that metabolic pathways have become changed. Why have they changed? Because mitochondria is not able to participate correctly. Cell is doing anabolic respiration. I still remember Dr. Paul Merrick had said, in those early discussions that the mitochondrial damage may be causing hypoxic states and it is not necessary that it is the lung damage that is the hypoxia. So I still remember in Math Plus reading a statement saying that something to the effect of don't start ventilation too early because the hypoxia may not be because of the lung issues but it may be because of mitochondrial damage. So here is another proof that mitochondria were not participating in Krebs cycle. So glycolysis was occurring. So glucose was more, but pyruvate was less. Okay, so what else did they see? Here is just a very quick chart. In this chart, the black bars are controls. Red bars are where they had co-incubated the glial cells, microglia, with SARS-CoV-2. Green ones are spike protein and microglia. In this chart, wherever there is a bracket and a p-value, that reading is significant. 
So if you see here, this is DNA, for example, compared to control, the DNA in SARS-CoV-2 or the spike protein is significantly reduced. At least for the SARS-CoV-2, it is significantly reduced. Same is the case for the RNA over here, and then glycine over here, and then unsaturated phospholipids. This was another finding that they had, that phospholipids that are present, and if I can just go to the next slide to show that, our cells have phospholipids that make up mostly cell membranes or vesicle coverings. What does that mean? If here is a cell, this outer membrane of the cell is usually a lipid, we call it a lipid bilayer, but it is actually a phospholipid bilayer. Bilayer meaning two layers. Then within the cell, for example, let's say this is Golgi apparatus. Golgi apparatus has phospholipid that makes this membrane of it. Endoplasmic reticulum has phospholipid that makes a membrane of it. Similarly, mitochondria and the membranes of the mitochondria have phospholipids in them. So these lipid content in various organelles are called lipidomes of those organelle or lipid components of those organelle. Now, if phospholipids are damaged, then the membranes will be damaged. Plus, keep this in mind, anytime lipid is damaged or lipid is oxidized, it triggers inflammation. This is the basis of inflammation, for example, for atherosclerosis. This is also the basis when there is lipids present in various bacteria which can cause inflammation. This is also the case when the reactive oxygen species cause lipid damage which in turn cause inflammation. So lipid damage is a big trigger for inflammation. Just keep that in your mind. So here we have phospholipids. These blue guys here are the phosphates and the orange or yellow ones are lipids. So these phospholipids were observed as well for their lipid saturation. And so another concept here, lipid, if they are oversaturated, then these become a little rigid and they become less functional and they trigger inflammation. So they found through the spectrometer they found that the average number of unsaturated bonds went down from about 4.3 in healthy to 3.7 and 3.8 in spike-treated or SARS-CoV heat inactivated SARS-CoV-2 treated. So lipid damage was occurring as well. And how was the damage occurring? Saturation was occurring. There should be unsaturated bonds that allows the fluidity and flexibility and normal function of the lipids. And that was now becoming saturated, which means lipids were getting damaged. Now, you could say, and they observed this more in the mitochondria. So you could say that they saw that in the mitochondria, maybe it was happening throughout the cell. Maybe those lipids were brought in to the mitochondria because lipid shuttling occurs as part of metabolisms. Maybe that lipid was actually damaged outside and then brought in. So this is why I said in the beginning to keep this question in your mind that was this cell-wide damage or just the mitochondria? So they looked at lipids in other organelle and they saw that lipids in other organelles were not damaged, but the lipids in the mitochondria were damaged. And the amount of lipid within the mitochondria was the same as the amount of lipid seen in the healthy cells, mitochondria. That means it was not extra lipid pouring in which was damaged outside the cytoplasm and then was brought into the mitochondria. It was mitochondrial lipid that got damaged. So what is the damage we are seeing? Saturation of the lipids within the mitochondria, the mitochondrial DNA damage and reduction, mitochondrial RNA upregulation. So now you could ask this question that how? Why? What is happening? Why is the mitochondria what does spike protein has to do with mitochondria? So researchers think that when the mitochondria, when the infection occurs, let me actually show you that quick excerpt here. So if you say, overall, our findings support a view that viral infection of host cells results in higher metabolic alterations to cope with the increased anabolic demand of the cell for viral replication. So what they're saying is that as the SARS-CoV-2 arrives. And this is the case with the spike protein as well. Although spike protein does not ask for replication, but it still causes enough disruption of the system that there is an anabolic stress. There is an anabolic mean making things. 
So when you're making more viruses or making disrupting the metabolic pathways, there could be stress on the mitochondria to produce more energy. That increased production of energy, just like in a car where you rev the engine, that increased production of energy produces reactive oxygen species. Those reactive oxygen species are usually within the mitochondria. They are actually handled very well because mitochondria knows I work with oxygen all the time and there are going to be reactive oxygen species. So mitochondria is actually very well built and prepared to handle the reactive oxygen species. But when you make those sparks too many, then the mitochondria cannot handle them. It gets overwhelmed. And now what happens is these reactive oxygen species that are produced because of extra fast rapid work, these species damage lipids, they cause lipid oxidation, they damage the respiratory chain. Now the respiratory chain itself can handle reactive oxygen species because it is playing with the oxygen all the time. But even then there can be an escape of reactive oxygen species and if you overwhelm that chain it would just leak reactive oxygen species. This is like a nuclear unit, nuclear plant getting exploded. So when it is functioning correctly, it can handle the energy and the waste products and everything and it is safe. But if explodes, then nothing is safe. That is a thing with the respiratory chain or electron transport chain that if it is working, it is fine. It is playing with the reactive oxygen species all the time. But as soon as it disrupts or it does more work than it can handle, then it starts leaking reactive oxygen species. Now those reactive oxygen species and damaged lipid particles, they do what? One, the metabolic system is disrupted. Protein imports in the mitochondria because the this whole system is now falling apart. So protein import is disrupted. Lipids are oxidated. The result of that is that now within the bigger community, the cell and the surroundings, the cell would start getting, so get out of the mitochondria. So mitochondria got damaged and that would cause its parent cell to start getting damaged, which would then cause the community around that to get damaged, which would cause the inflammatory response to occur, which would cause even more damage. The end result, once again, as I said before, neuroinflammation, neuronal death, neurocognitive declines. Now, in addition to that, because glycolysis start occurring, glycolysis is where the glucose is used up to make energy, but the mitochondria are really not functioning or not functioning in the sufficient quantity and quality, then the cell is doing anaerobic respiration, glycolysis. Glycolysis, as I said before, has its own problems if it continues for a long time, especially acidosis and less energy production, which puts even more demand on the cell to do more work because now it is producing less energy. In addition, as the mitochondria and the cell starts getting damaged, there are pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or as the guts start spilling, the surrounding inflammatory cells would observe. This is just like if a house gets burnt down and we are standing near it, we'll see the burnt house and the burnt pieces. Same thing here, pathogen-associated molecular patterns would be seen, the broken SARS-CoV-2 and the spike proteins and so on. Damp, damage-associated molecular pattern. As the cells and the mitochondria are damaged, these can be observed in the surroundings by the sensing cells, macrophages and other microglia. ATP is released, oxidized lipids are released, heat shock proteins are activated. Heat shock proteins are proteins within the cell that are kind of sensors of stress on the cell. And if the cell is under stress, they become activated. Now, all of this, PAMs and DAMs and oxidized lipids and heat shock, they have their own outcomes. PAMP, DAMP, oxidated lipids would activate other inflammatory cells to start becoming hyperactive and they would cause inflammation and tissue damage. Heat shock protein activation would cause a cell to undergo apoptosis. Continuous glycolysis or anaerobic respiration would also trigger the cell to go towards apoptosis. What does that mean? Within the cell, when these stress signals are received within the cell, 
Then there are proteins called caspases. They become activated. These caspases would then activate another set of proteins called ubiquitins. These are activated. Eventually, the cell is told by its own internal components to kill itself. That is apoptosis. Cells die all the time. Cells can die in two, three ways. One way is that they silently die without saying that I am under stress. And so that is a natural, normal cell death. It happens all the time. Our blood cells are formed and destroyed all the time. Our skin cells are formed and destroyed all the time. Our GIT cells and so on. So that is apoptosis. But if a cell dies by while it was not ready to die, for example, it is broken by a pathogen, then that is a damaged cell. Now, if it is an immune cell that didn't want to die, but we forced it to die because of all those stresses as we saw above, then it would activate the inflammasomes, which are kind of packets of, imagine it's a bomb. It's a packet of inflammatory molecules that it would just release in the surroundings to say, I did not want to die, but they made me die because of this metabolic pressure on me and damaging mitochondria. And that inflammasomes activity would cause surrounding immune system cells to become active. Autophagy will be triggered and eventually cell death will occur. So that, how did it start? If I just summarize it, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein arrived or the SARS-CoV-2 arrived. There is anabolic pressure on the cell to make more things. Plus, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein itself alters the machinery of the cell. The result of that is pressure on the mitochondria to produce more energy. Mitochondria does produce more energy, upregulates mRNA, but in that process, reactive oxygen species are produced. We start damaging the mitochondria, lipids, DNAs, and the mitochondrial DNA goes down, the production of new mitochondria go down, the lipids of the mitochondria are, are damaged. The result is mitochondrial function goes down, which means now the cell is going to start doing anaerobic respiration, which will mean now the cell is going to go down. When the cell dies, either by inflammasome, it's a microglia, or by apoptosis, it is going to release, mostly with the inflammasome, it's going to release the inflammatory markers that would activate the inflammatory system. The end result is clear damage to whatever tissue it is in. Now, these are the takeaways. And I wanted to have you look at their own summary of their discussion. So, one, they said that there is a diagnostic significance. So, one, they said that our data suggests this. Therefore, examining mitochondrial function or mitochondrial damage markers in the microglia cells in response to interaction with SARS-CoV-2 may identify pathways of viral pathogenesis. So, this is the diagnosis and discovery. And then they say, look at this green part. Furthermore, therapeutic strategies that modulate mitochondrial processes may be efficacious in treating patients with neuro-COVID. I would suggest other COVID too, but this study is about microglia. Our study calls for the development of mitochondria-targeted pharmaceutical drugs that can neutralize virus-induced reactive oxygen species production in the cellular organelles. And throughout this talk, I just kept remembering that FLCCC had one and a half year or two years ago said, please take care of the mitochondria. Here are the ways to do that. So they were ahead of time. So anyways, this is the summary. Then here is another study, Mitochondrial Dynamics in SARS-CoV-2 Spike Protein Treated Human Microglia. Again, microglia. I think we can extrapolate that to other cells too. Thus, our data suggests that SARS-CoV-2 induces a significant inflammatory response, increased oxidative stress, inflammasome activation, and mitochondrial dysfunction in microglial cells, all of which contribute to COVID-associated neuropathology. This study provides important mechanistic insights into SARS-CoV-2-induced mitochondrial dysfunction, which underlies COVID-19-associated neuropathologies. So that is the discussion. Thank you very much for watching. I think mitochondrial damage is the first damage that occurs in the cell. And then the whole cell comes tumbling down. Mitochondria is the first victim. And we should care for the mitochondria. So that is the discussion. Thank you very much. And I would see you next week. Bye for now.